Hi class, welcome to unit two. In this unit, we are going to look at states of matter and energy. In this lesson, lesson one, we're going to look at the characteristics of the three states of matter and we're going to determine whether a phase change has occurred. Make sure you are always taking notes when watching these videos. I've provided you guided notes on Google Classroom to help you along. Chemistry is the study of matter and its changes. Energy is what changes matter. There are two types of energy when dealing with matter. There is kinetic energy and there is potential energy. Recall from the previous unit that kinetic energy, the energy of motion, is related to temperature. Recall that the average kinetic energy exactly equals the Kelvin temperature. Remember, when the Kelvin temperature is zero, there is no molecular motion. It is always true that when kinetic energy is changing, so is the temperature. Potential energy is considered stored energy, but it, in this class, we can better understand potential energy as phase energy. Potential energy is related to the position of the particles. You already should know that when you change phase, you change the position of the particles. Here, the solid particles are tightly packed together. But as I change the phase to a liquid, I spread the particles out. I change their position. A change in phase or a phase change is always a change in potential energy. Chemical changes also experience potential energy, but those are a little bit more complicated. Let's look at a picture here. Here we have a chemical change. Here we have a bond being formed. This again is a change in potential energy because notice that the atoms of hydrogen are coming together. They are coming closer together. So their positions are less far apart. So here is a change in potential energy. Take a minute to pause the video and copy down the characteristics of solids, liquids, and gases. Now, most of this information is probably review from middle school. But some of this information, particularly right here, IMF. IMF stands for intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are forces that hold molecules together. They are not bonds. Bonds hold different elements together in a compound. Here you can see the bonds that hold the oxygen atoms together in elemental oxygen. Bonds are drawn in black. What an intermolecular force is, is a force of attraction that holds one oxygen molecule next to another. You can see the intermolecular force here in purple. Again, it just is holding two of these kind of figure eight shapes next to one another. Intermolecular forces in solids are really strong. That makes it so the particles, although are moving, because they have kinetic energy, they vibrate in a fixed position. They are held so tightly together that the particles always have a definite shape and a definite volume. So if you put an ice cube in a glass, the ice will maintain its own shape. Now liquids, they have weaker intermolecular forces than solids, but not as weak as gases. They're intermediate intermolecular forces. Liquids are able to slide past one another. They are more spread apart, and this weaker intermolecular force causes them to have a definite volume. So if you have a cup of water, you'll always have a cup of water. But it may have a different shape depending on the container in which you put it in. Now gases 
are considered to have no intermolecular forces at all, or at least ideal gases. They have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume. They always completely fill any container they take. And lastly, it is said that ideal gases, or in a perfect world, gases are in constant, random, straight-line motion. Another important difference is in the phases is the entropy. Entropy is defined as disorder. So solids have very low entropy, followed by liquids, then aqueous, and finally gases have very high entropy because they are in constant, random, straight line motion. You cannot contain a gas without a lid in your container. Use your notes to answer this region's question about the gaseous state of matter. Here's one more question about gases. Come on, think about it. I know you can do this. Look back at your notes to see how the volume of a gas can be characterized. Here is a review slide of something we covered in Unit 1, which is determining the state of matter at any given temperature. Remember that what we do is we take the given temperature and insert it into a number line between the melting point and boiling point from reference table S. If that number falls before the melting point, you have a solid. If it is sandwiched between the melting and the boiling point, you have a liquid. And if it is greater than both the melting and the boiling point, you have a gas. Now, recall, if you are given the value of STP, use table A to find the temperature. Let's see if we can find the state of matter of hydrogen, element number one, at 350 degrees Kelvin. So here we can see that we have a melting point of 14 and a boiling point of 20. Since 350 is greater than both 14 and 20, then hydrogen will be a gas at 350 Kelvin. Now let's apply the same principle to one more example, in this case, lithium. When we see that lithium has a melting point of 454 and a boiling point of 1,615, the number 350 is less than 454. So lithium will be a solid at 350. Now it is your turn to try a few examples. Here you can see a description of the three states of matter and the phase change that occurs when you change from one state to another. Many of these are likely to be review. I am pretty sure you already are aware of what melting and freezing, vaporization or boiling, and condensation are but the two new phase changes that you might not be familiar with, but are very important, are sublimation, which occurs when a solid turns straight into a gas. This happens with dry ice or carbon dioxide. It also happens with iodine. It is very important that you know what sublimation is, or the verb is to sublime. So carbon dioxide and iodine are two substances that readily sublime at STP. When we change from one phase to another, we also change the entropy or the measure of disorder. So when we look at solid, liquid, and gas, we see solid has the most order because it has a definite shape and a definite volume, and gas has the least order because it has no definite shape and no definite volume. When answering questions, you can always replace the word entropy with disorder. 
The last thing we'll examine today is the difference between endothermic reactions and exothermic reactions. We will visit this concept throughout the entire year. Take a moment to pause the video so you can get these notes down. Endothermic reactions absorb energy. During phase changes, that can be used to spread the particles further apart and increase entropy. During chemical changes, endothermic reactions are used to break bonds. Breaking bonds can spread particles further apart. Notice that in endothermic reactions, heat can be written as kilojoules or simply as the word heat. But in a chemical reaction, it will always appear on the reactant side. And the delta H, or the symbol for heat, will always be a positive sign. Exothermic reactions always release heat. During phase changes, this release allows the particles to move closer. During a chemical change, the release of energy allows for the making of bonds. This is why most substances are found bonded together, because together, bonded, they can have lower energy. They can release the excess energy. Notice how exothermic reactions have the heat term on the product side, or the delta H is negative. You should not memorize if a reaction is endothermic or exothermic, but instead you should use reference table I. It is hard to determine if a reaction will be endothermic or exothermic because in most reactions, bonds are both made and broken. Notice here for this reaction for the formation of hydrochloric acid, we have to break bonds on the reactant side before we can make bonds on the product side. So again, we can look at reference table I to see if this formation is endothermic or exothermic. Or exothermic. We'll talk more about how to use reference table I and write in heat and equation in class. This concludes lesson one of unit two.